Hi everyone, this is Charles Hoskinson broadcasting pre-recorded from warm sunny Colorado. Today's going to be a fun one. Always warm, always sunny, sometimes Colorado, especially on the pre-recorded days. So we have had a hell of a week. It's been uh, an interesting time. And really, the topic at hand is this concept of free speech. And the rights of corporations, the rights of individuals, the rights to deplatform, the rights to permit things. And uh, you hear all these terms like uh, supporting Nazis or uh, fire in a theater or anything like that. And uh, apparently, all those who disagree with me are evil and must be deplatformed in order to prevent violence. Somehow, the mere idea of letting a man speak or a woman speak is so threatening that if we do, the certainty of violence. Apparently, it was free speech that led to the rise of the Nazis. When World War I wasn't a crummy economic condition, it wasn't the rise of fascism throughout Europe, like Italy and other places like that. It wasn't uh, rampant racism in that society that uh, uh, had been pushed in the late 19th and 20th century. No, 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 no. It was just simply letting people speak their minds, even though actually people couldn't, because there wasn't a guarantee of freedom of speech during the Warmark Republic or prior to that to the Kaiser. Uh, that is what led to the rise of the Nazis. It's a crazy thing. And we kind of sit with these concepts of social media and we're being presented a lie, a false dichotomy. And the dichotomy is either absolute, unrestricted, complete free speech or controlled speech. And the hypothesis is if you don't have controlled speech where some trusted third party, usually self-proclaimed, ruling by fiat, uh, moderates the medium, then uh, you're going to descend and everybody's going to become a Nazi. We're all evil. We're all destructive. We're all bad actors. Violence is going to occur. All these people are going to die. <laughs> and uh, society will completely collapse. And they you always use the fire in a theater thing when they talk about absolute free speech. By the way, you can always yell fire in the theater, no matter what. There's currently nothing that prevents you from doing that. You will probably go to jail if it results in the loss of life or harm to others. Why? Because you incited a riot. You're held accountable for the consequences of your speech, yet you still have the capability of yelling it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about a third option, something to get out of this false dichotomy. You'll see this a lot in bad logical arguments, especially by those who desire power or control over people or want to legitimize business models that are counterproductive to freedom and liberty. These false dichotomies where uh, either you do this absolutely crazy thing that's counterproductive or you accept that I have total control, one or the other. Whenever you hear that, you should be instantly suspicious. It's a logical fallacy. The reality is that when you talk about a social network, the whole reason these things work, they're called a multi-sided market. So you have a producer and a consumer. Okay. And so you are the producer of information, info. And then your friends or other people who follow you who are socially connected to you they consume that information. So the earliest multi-sided markets that we saw were things like eBay, for example, and then we see it with Airbnb, we see it with Uber, and basically they have a middleman, the platform provider, and their job is to connect the producer and consumer. And they also act as kind of a regulator of sorts. Uh, of the producer and consumer. So in the case of eBay, uh, consumer protections, buyer protections, seller protections, uh, power seller ratings, these types of things. Uh, so you know who you're doing business with. In the case of Facebook, well, uh, certain types of predatory profiles, uh, let's go ahead and remove. Like for example, uh, the 40 year old creeper who lives in the basement that keeps sending friend requests to 11 year old girls probably a good idea to look into that one. That's probably going to result in a bad outcome. Okay. So we accept that regulation of a platform makes sense. And in small 
communities, usually the regulation of a platform is um, not super problematic uh, because if it's poorly regulated, the community will die out. If it's well regulated, the community will probably have good information flow. So for example, if you're moderating Telegram channel or a Reddit moderator or something like that, you kind of get a sense of what type of community is and it stays relatively consistent. Where it gets problematic is when you start having interactions with the billions of people. And here you have to figure out a little bit more. You have to figure out uh, how, basically how to automate. And then also you have to ask yourself, what exactly are people doing? What types of interactions are people doing? Like, for example, let's go ahead and have Alice. And Alice, give her a little dress. Actually, let's give her a blue dress. There we go. You can see those drawing classes really paid off. Let's say that Alice wants to share something. So she wants to share a news article. Okay, so uh, let's say that uh, there's a news article and the news article is the Insurre Insurrection Act of 1807 and how uh, Trump has just enacted it. Okay, now this is probably fake news. I've been seeing it float around Twitter today and today is January 10th and a lot of people are saying, oh, Trump has initiated the Insurrection Act and uh, it's like the final crescendo of the QAnon conspiracy and so forth. All right. So she wants to share that. And she's friends with Bob. All right. So here's Bob. And he sees in his news feed this article. So first, Bob has questions. Maybe he doesn't even know what the Insurrection Act of... 1807 is okay and then there's a claimed event is that true or false and then there's a question about the credibility of alice so in this type of a structure this producer consumer construction where you have alice and bob uh, and alice has pushed something where she's not the originator of that content there's an implicit statement that she's making if the only thing she can do is click a button and share about the veracity of the information. Okay, it's so the truthiness of the information. How reliable is that? Is it made up? Is it true? And really, Bob is not in a position to really know too much about that. So unless he has a lot of knowledge about Alice, is she a conspiracy theorist? Is she uh, uh, very, very discriminating in the things that she shares? Uh, basically, he's not in a position just on the origins of who shared it to know if that's credible. And if the article is written in, in a certain way and maybe come from a uh, you know, somewhat credible source, perhaps he's inclined to believe it. So this is kind of the propagation of fake news. And it can be indeed weaponized. And the only defense right now, if your system is completely uncurated and you allow people to share, is that Bob in some way has to have, and let's call it um, a mind vaccine against fake news. He has been inoculated with some sort of thinking skills, thinking tools, that when he sees something, he can critically analyze it to a point where he is able to say, oh, that's fake. That didn't happen. But if Bob doesn't have that inoculation or if his immune system for this gets overwhelmed from many different sources, then the issue is that Bob is eventually going to let one of these in. And when it gets let in, uh, he's going to get either angry or paranoid or scared, or he's going to share it himself. To Jim, and to Bill, and to Jane, and so forth. Okay, and that's basically what it ends up happening in practice. Uh, we see a lot of junk be spread on networks. Uh, things riddled with confirmation bias. Things that have not been analyzed. Things that have been manufactured by 
uh, 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 foreign powers for the purpose of dividing people or attacking truth. Uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty crazy dynamics. And there's numerous books and articles and scientific papers that are written about the spread of disinformation. And the problem is, if you're only reliant upon the thinking skills of people receiving things, those are only effective up to people's domains of competence and the quantity of information that they're exposed to on a daily basis. If they continue to get further and further exposed over and over again, just like an actual immune system, uh, the problem is at some point it folds and then it starts replicating and spreading throughout the network like a contagion. So the platforms themselves can have a lot of power just on the tool sets that they give and how they allow people to quantify themselves uh, to ameliorate this concern. So what the lie we're being told when we go back to the uh, controlled idea is that somehow the platform, either through automation or a mechanical Turk process, is going to hire fact checkers and then these fact checkers are uniquely qualified and infallible and are somehow always going to look at these articles and be able to know that they're true or false or annotate them and label them. Now, Bob had nothing to do with selecting those fact checkers. He has no relationship with them, didn't ask for them to be there. Apparently, the platform as the regulator has decided to come on in. And not only that, they can attach social consequences to fact checking. So if Alice shares too much stuff that they determine to be wrong, uh, then they just, just get rid of her account altogether. So you violated our terms of service. It's an incredibly dangerous thing because fact checkers are not God. They're not infallible. They don't have context, especially if they're automated. Uh, and what happens if they start viewing things that are political opinions as uh, no longer just a difference of opinion, but harmful uh, fake news to their world viewpoint. Huge problem. So I think this entire model is Pyrrhic at best and very damaging. Instead, what you have to do is a much more bottomed up approach, okay? So first off, you have to distinguish uh, sourced and verified information from anonymous, okay? Then you have to create weights, okay? And those weights can be reputation, those can be money, uh, those can be other things like work, for example, okay? You can create all kinds of weights that appear behind something. Okay, so uh, first was sourced and verified. Bob knew it was Alice sharing it because let's say it was done on Facebook and that's a semi-anonymous, semi-non-anonymous system. Uh, you can create a real life profile. Most people use their names, but you still can create a fake profile. And I did a prior video about DIDs and this concept of verified tweets, but we are living in an age where you can create a verified, legitimate, credible KYC identity. This would be equivalent to uh, the blue check mark on Twitter or something like that. So this concept of a, a verified account, okay? Because impersonation occurs all the time. We see this, for example, with giveaway scams, in the cryptocurrency space, where people share through social media all this very harmful content where they're trying to impersonate me or impersonate, uh, you know, uh, Steve Wozniak or Brad Garlinghouse or somebody to basically convince people to send them cryptocurrencies. And so the whole point of verification is that you know that the person sharing is real. Okay, so verified is one, and what are the sources behind it? So if you already build into the system a strong differentiation between anonymous sources, anonymous news, so maybe when Alice shares something that was generated by anonymous people or uh, anonymous people are sharing it, that it appears differently in the GUI itself. So instantly when Bob is looking at it, he knows it's in a different trust category. Okay, so it's anonymous and unverified. Now there's no fact checker involved here. It's just no one is willing to vouch for this particular information. 
And you can have this in the granularity of the sharing experience for the propagation of news. So for example, with Alice, she can have different ways of sharing. She could say, share unverified. And what this basically means is I don't vouch for this. I haven't vetted it myself. I'm not willing to put any reputational weight behind it. Okay. Or she could say share and vouch. Okay. So for example, she could sign it with her did. And maybe there's a notion of uh, some sort of uh, social currency inside the system. And she's willing to put some of that social currency at risk if it turns out that turns out to be fake. So that's money. You can even have a, a rate limiting where she has to solve some form of a proof of work. Maybe use a VDF and has to solve that to create some weight behind this. First, to slow the propagation of things down and also to say, hey, there's an actual expense to sharing this particular type of information. You can also share with a story. Okay, so you can do things like you can add metadata to this. For example, I don't think this article is completely right. Uh, there's some things that I'm, as a domain expert, uh, aware of that were not mentioned here. Then there's obviously bias. Okay. You could also share with requests. And that's where you say, hey, there's something missing here. And maybe you guys can help fill this in. For example, maybe we can crowdsource vetting. For example, the other day I saw an article um, and it looked legitimate, but I still haven't verified it yet. And uh, it was that a, a town in Massachusetts has apparently banned uh, from its curriculum the Odyssey. Now that would be a very deeply troubling and disturbing thing. And I would have loved to have this option right here to share with request for crowdsourcing, where I could ask people to come and annotate and give me the whole story and tell me a little bit more than what the article told me. The article looks credible, but I don't know much about the uh, publication itself. And I don't know if I'm getting a very biased story or there are alternative things. Okay. So this goes on and on and on and on. There's many different options that you have when you talk about sharing things. And it comes down to, are you sharing unverified anonymously sourced concepts and ideas? Are you prepared to put your identity reputation on this? What are you prepared to vouch for the thing that you're sharing before it goes to Bob? Okay, so that's one dimension is when Alice either creates something or she finds something and she wants to propagate it throughout her social network, can you construct weights, metadata, challenges, and other stories behind that? None of this is done at the moment in most modern social networks, which is extraordinary to me because this alone would massively propagate uh, the spread of misinformation, disinformation, and other such things. You also can gamify the ability to curate and get to the truth about things, especially when you start crowdsourcing annotations to things. For example, you can have what are called uh, bias pairings. Perhaps it's even uh, more apt to call it a bias tuple. And what that's all about is, let's say that you have a very biased article from CNN, which tends to lean liberal these days. Well, maybe on that same topic, you can pair that with something from Fox News. Okay, so now you have two viewpoints and you can call it a tuple because maybe you can do news one news two all the way through to i okay you can actually pair information together now what you can do if you have a monetary side of things some sort of a, a token within the system you can give incentives for people to link news together so instead of just having an article you have a news graph, okay? So you have your article in relation to many related news sources, which in turn are related to their own sources, 
and these vertices, they have their own weights on them about what is the nature of the connections. You can construct a graph database anytime a news article is shared. And what happens is when Alice is sharing something, if these things pre-exist, what you can do is you can show her ahead of time the knowledge graph of where her article sits in relation to many other articles in the entire set. Okay. And what's really nice is that if you have a good way of semantically parsing things, you can start using AI in a lot of these different things and find some common themes and trends and other such things. And also you can get a notion of shallowness of understanding. Okay. So we're starting to see this in certain social networks where they ask you, did you really read the article before you tweeted it? Well, if it's a 5,000 word article, you spent three seconds on it. You probably read the headline. You don't really have a deep understanding of that or the graph upon which this lives and so forth. So you can create rewards for people to pair ideas together especially different viewpoints and construct knowledge graphs. And then there's all kinds of automation we can construct and being able to predict whether we actually understand what we've read and also uh, the relationship of what we've read the, uh, to other elements of knowledge. Okay. So it's a super powerful technique and tool. And this alone would uh, moderate people tremendously. Why? Because you have idea flow. We have this concept of confirmation bias, and we have this concept of uh, basically people living in echo chambers. And so the problem is that people are only going to associate, if left to their own devices, with people with somewhat similar ideas to themselves. And people are, on average, not always, but most people, when they're left to their own devices, will actively seek information to confirm their biases versus information to the contrary. We all do this, no matter how good we are at thinking we don't, this is a standard cognitive bias. And you see it a lot with the anti-vaxxer movement. You see it a lot with dozens of human endeavors. Okay, if you start from a viewpoint that somebody is bad or something happened, you will actively disregard information to the contrary. For example, the election fraud allegations. Nothing the U.S. government does, no investigation the U.S. government embarks upon will be viewed as credible. So you can have a bipartisan commission come together. You can have retired judges come out of retirement uh, who are nonpartisan and conduct big investigations. You can do all kinds of things. The problem is the kind of conspiratorial thinking that's wrapped around election fraud has done so in a way that the very institutions that would conduct the investigation are assumed to be corrupt. So any information they produce will be disregarded and any information that shows their corruption will be overemphasized. And you create a feedback loop that makes people more and more radical and more and more certain in the, uh, in the existence of a conspiracy. And then when people oppose that, even if those people were previously trusted, they will then be exiled, excommunicated because they've been co-opted or corrupted. Okay. And this closely related to the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, basically where people believe they know more than they actually do. And it gives them a false sense of confidence. Suddenly everybody knows about Benford's law. Suddenly everybody's a statistician and knows that things are statistically impossible and have domain expertise that they really actually don't know. Suddenly everybody's an expert on every uh, election system around and everybody knows how the voting machines work, where those voting machines are, the audit standards of the voting machines are wrong because they watched a video of something with limited context. Okay, that's the spread of misinformation. And because it's done in an echo chamber and there's no counterbalance to that, it creates radicalization and it can be done for anything. This is where ethnic cleansing comes from. This is where rampant racism comes from. Uh, you know, if people are racist, uh, let's say against Latinos, they're far more likely to share articles about MS-13. Uh, they're far more likely to share 
articles about the negative consequences of illegal immigration. Certainly it's a social problem and there's certainly issues there and they need to be dealt with, but they're much less likely to share an article about a positive thing that's happened. Let's say an illegal immigrant uh, jumped off a bridge and uh, saved a, to, to go into the water to save a drowning child. They see that article, they wouldn't even share it, statistically speaking. There's been thousands of studies about this in most major universities that think about these things over the last 20 years to show these biases at work. That's why it's so incredibly important that you do bias pairing and you have tuples to ensure idea flow. So whenever something is shared, the system should create incentives for people to actively seek out opposing viewpoints or more nuanced viewpoints and share them together as a pair or construct a knowledge graph. And if there's the absence of that, and you notice that people are consuming only the same information again and again and again, the system's algorithms should indicate that that's a failure inside the system. Now, you know something, none of the things that I've mentioned involve censorship of information. None of the things that I've mentioned say that people should be deplatformed. None of the things that I've mentioned uh, have said that uh, basically there's certain forbidden pieces of knowledge that you are not allowed to see, even if that knowledge is made up Okay, so far we're just talking about the structure of sharing, the structure of consumption, and a realization of biases. See, another thing you can do is you can incentivize people in the system to develop, as I mentioned up here, kind of a mind vaccine, a mind inoculation, a mind resistance, thinking tools to consume information. Okay. So in, in essence, you should have a checklist when you share information. And you go through the entire checklist. Is there confirmation bias? Okay, is this person sharing it, a domain expert or not, et cetera, et cetera. And there's tons of cognitive fallacies you can look at, and the philosophers assemble them all the time. Human beings, for example, are very bad at, it, at understanding exponential growth. And what you can do is you can create community curated checklists and basically say that if you go through this entire checklist when you're receiving a piece of information and the information passed, you can also vouch for it. And by vouching for that, perhaps you give some form of social capital to the sharer, the origins of it, a kudos. So you see this a lot with like a thumbs up type of a system, okay, or thumbs down. So you can create a far more elegant rating system. And what you can do is you can certify and vouch information based upon how rigorous of the analysis that the information has. You can even create bounties. Bounties where you know, there's a reward for people to perform critical analysis of things and see if it passes. We do this all the time in software, security audits, formal verification, these types of things. You can create thinking tool checklists. Dan Dennett does a great job with that. There's dozens of books that are written that explain uh, how people's cognitive biases work. And you can even create AI curation in this sense. AI is becoming increasingly more capable of understanding context than uh, parsing the semantics of things to a point where it actually can understand what you're trying to say. And what the AI can do, because it has no biases, you know, not strictly true, but doesn't have the human biases. Uh, they can be uh, absorbed through training. Uh, but uh, in general, AI doesn't have an agenda other than the agenda we give it. Uh, you can apply that towards these types of curations. And then you can, for high value information, propagate bounties and these other types of things, okay? And by the way, all of this can be gamified. It can be put into fun experiences. It's things that we can do to incentivize people to behave correctly. And what you do is you say, all right, well, the stuff that you don't do this for, we're gonna put into a special box. And if you wanna go parse that special box for hidden gems, okay, but more often than not, the things that are sourced and verified, the things that have weight behind it, the things that are certified by some form of a community curation metric, 
uh, the things that we've actually invested some time into and we've properly balanced and we've ensured there's idea flow. It's also called social physics. Doing these types of things, we're apt to be in a better place. Okay, so what about banning? What about deplatforming and these types of things? Well, this is where you have terms of conduct. And I think the reasonable way of approaching this is saying, all right, there are certain foundations upon which you shall never be restricted. Okay, so if you're a member of the system, you should be able to have your friends and communicate with your friends. It makes no sense to cut people off because here's the thing, if you deplatform somebody, the Nazi doesn't go away. They just use signal and they use increasingly more secretive and anonymous means of communicating with each other. And then you have the Oklahoma City bombing. It predated Facebook. By definition, we were all deplatformed. Domestic terrorism happens without social media. Radicalization happens without social media. If you take them off the platform, you're not solving the problem. You're just making them more isolated, validating whatever conspiracies they already believe in and radicalizing them more. By having some baseline where they at least are there, it gives you some starting point to work with. Okay? Then you have a concept of communities. And every community has every right, like an HOA does, to have a terms of conduct. So we do this, for example, with the Cardano Telegram channels. So if they say this channel does not discuss trading information, this is for information related to Cardano that's not about trading and the appreciation or depreciation of value of ADA. If somebody comes into that community and refuses to abide by that term of conduct, what you do is you send them back. You kick them out. Now, did they lose access to the Cardano protocol? No. Did they lose the ability to build things on the Cardano protocol? No. Did they lose the ability to stake? No. Did they lose the ability to vote? No. They still have those abilities because this is the baseline. It's a foundational thing. You have fundamental rights as a holder of ADA to the, be able to use the protocol. And by possessing ADA, those rights are guaranteed by code. Nobody has the power to come in and arbitrarily take them from you because they think you're a bad person. However, communities to function do require curation. And by joining that community, you are signing up for that. One of the problems we have right now with deplatforming is it's not just the case where people have a communication platform and they're saying, we're not going to let you advertise and use that platform. They're being blacklisted and cut out of all of society. Okay, so Parler is an example of this. They, oh, well, you can always just compete with Twitter if you don't like Twitter's terms of conduct. Great, that's what Parler did. But then Apple and Google deplatform, they lose 100% of the mobile market, market that matters. So now no communication can happen on iPhones or Google devices. Then their web host boots them off, Amazon. So now they can't even have a website. Okay, so they were basically thrown away from the baseline. That's the equivalent of saying, even though you hold ADA, you should have rights. We're just going to take staking away from you, voting away from you, your ability to transact, the ability to use the protocol. It's been put into a sandbox. Okay, that's too far. But uh, if Parler was allowed to compete with Twitter, banning somebody from Twitter would not be a problem because perhaps the speech and viewpoints they have are acceptable on parlor okay and they can go in there and do their thing there and at least they have a, a community that's accepting to them so for example in this example where i said hey this person's not allowed to talk about trading well it turns out that there's a trading telegram channel it's actually several of them and they're by different entities and they're moderated in different ways so of course they can go there and say when moon and these types of things there's a community for them no community has dominion over the other. No community has power over the other. And you're allowing people to communicate with each other. So I think that there's a big difference between a baseline of functionality and community curation. And if that baseline, if you go below it, it causes harm to society as a whole, gives powers to people that who shouldn't have those powers, like the ability to pick winners and losers. It creates a big problem 
you know, I don't want to unilaterally hand to five companies the ability to decide who can stay in business and who can't. Imagine you being told you can't have a cell phone app, you can't have a website, and uh, you're going to be unable to use any SaaS product. And okay, go be a modern business. It's just insane. Oh, by the way, you also can't have a payment processor or a bank account. Uh, there's no way you'd be able in a modern economy to survive as a business like that. So effectively, these terms of conduct have gone beyond the use of an individual service, and they've percolated down to the baseline saying, you can no longer use the web of society. Okay, that can't happen. We can't allow that to happen. And the goal here ought to be de-radicalization. So you take collections of communities that you know are not thinking productively. And what you do is you engage. You don't isolate and ban, you engage. To use the Nazi example, back in the 1920s and 30s, it was the lack of engagement, it was the demonization and uh, their perceived persecutions in society that emboldened them to become more radicalized and militarized. You see, and so if somebody had the ability to penetrate into those communities, and de-radicalize them and demonstrate that the ideologies that they had and the viewpoints that they have are counterproductive and need nuances, they would have lost a lot of momentum and moral authority. It was then when they got bottled up and pressured up to a point where they felt the only recourse was to go into the most extreme viewpoint and do it as a collective. That's when they grab torches. That's when they make bombs. That's when they go crazy. So engagement always is desirable over isolation. Never isolate uh, crazy movements and philosophies. Uh, it creates a lot of problems in the long term. They get uh, more and more radicalized, and then they feel their only option is violence. So removing people from their ability to communicate only legitimizes uh, the um, viewpoints that they have in their mind. And then, then what they'll do is Go meet an, uh, an Uncle Geech's cabin in the middle of nowhere and talk about how to make a fertilizer bomb. It's what they do. Okay. So what the platform ought to do is have well-moderated communities. and They do have terms of conduct. And then have a concept of engagement for people who can't fit into communities and create incentives in the platform for doing this. De-incentivizing the confirmation bias component and having bias pairings I think is one of the most powerful tools for that. And creating community expectations that ideas, once shared, they have to have work behind them. They have to have vouching behind them. And gamifying the annotation of content uh, goes a very, very long way. Because the kinds of things that will radicalize the crazy people inside a community will be absent of these things. And it's very difficult for them to uh, acknowledge that that absence is a, a positive attribute. They can't say, well, we can't do any knowledge prayer because only our ideas are valid. No, what ends up happening is that usually you have the most extreme of the extreme, and then you have people kind of on the edges, and the most extreme of the extreme only have a kind of a weakish hold on those people on the edges. If you isolate these people, they get pushed together. If you uh, disengage and if you engage them and, and you give them an opt-out and a process for redemption, a process to get out of that club, what happens is that those people who have a weak hold will break free and then they'll actually become redeemed. In fact, there's a very famous uh, guy, and I forget his name right now, but he's an African-American, and he actively goes out to members of the Ku Klux Klan, an organization in America that hates African-Americans, they're white supremacists, and he engages them and he finds the, the weak links and he breaks them and he convinces them to leave the Ku Klux Klan. And he's been so successful at this uh, that he actually has uh, a room in his house with all of the uh, uniforms of former Klan's members. When they leave the Klan, they give him uh, their uniforms. And so he has hundreds of them because throughout the years he's done that. And the only tool he has in his tool bag is engagement. He goes out and actually talks to people and he convinces them that their ideas aren't true. An effective social media platform should have this capacity to lift people up. It should identify which users inside the system are 
being cleaked into very siloed, self-serving echo chambers, and which ones have good idea flow and are engaging with a diverse population. The silo cliqued units, uh, they need to find ways to build bridges and connect them. And these can be dramatic affairs, these can be subtle engagement, these can be slight tweaks in algorithms and so forth. The problem is the way that the algorithms currently work for most social media is that maximizing profit, maximizing advertising, maximizing the flow of information is usually around breaking people into silos and allowing those silos to become radicalized. So in many ways, the radicalization that we're seeing in the 21st century is a direct result of algorithmic malfeasance where the platforms themselves have been programmed. And again, I don't think the solution is deplatforming and community curate and uh, top-down curation and anointing a collection of uh, pre-selected fact checkers and so forth. I think it's bottom up in creating marketplaces. And actually, uh, the other thing is when we talk about fact checkers and bounties, you can actually create a marketplace for fact checking. Okay. So for example, in the Twitter video, I mentioned this idea that you do fact checking by installing plugins. So you can still have a concept of a fact checker in this entire set. It's just an additional layer of curation. So when we talk about bias pairings, you can create fact check tuples. Okay, so basically if you install one fact checker, you install alternative fact checkers who have different philosophical viewpoints or standards, and then you get the whole story. You see the entirety of the fact checking. So you see what PolitiFact has had to say. You see what the Blaze has had to say. You know, you see what, you know, I don't know, uh, the university has had to say, some think tank, some NGO, or whatever. And then maybe, uh, you know, some person's opinion, you know, Bob's opinion or something like that. But you get the totality of all these things. You get these things. And what AI can do is it can curate this in a way where you have common themes, common things that all of these actors will agree upon. Uh, some cases, they disagree so fundamentally that you actually have disjoints. For example, uh, you know, it, the aliens didn't land in Roswell. The aliens did land in Roswell, right? This is like one of those either it happened or it didn't happen type of deals, and you're going to have radically different opinions on that. And where you have disjoints, you have to have the presentation of evidence. And then you look at this in a quality viewpoint. Okay, so it's not just good enough to anoint somebody as a fact checker. They must always show you the evidence that they're basing their fact checking and their methodology of analysis. Okay. And you say, God, Charles, this is a lot of work. Well, yeah, it is a lot of work. Uh, it's a lot easier just click share. It's a lot easier just to click thumbs up. It's a lot easier to click heart right? But the problem is that if you don't put any work in, then these systems are basically propaganda machines. Sovereign governments like the CCP, the Communist Party of China, uh, and uh, Russia and others in the United States, uh, they conduct what are called psyops campaigns, psychological operations. Happens all over the world. Western governments and Eastern governments alike do it. And what they do is they take advantage of the fact that we don't have a proper bag of tools and the social networks are not constructed in the right way to basically install division and convince people of things that are not true. Some cases they do it just to destroy the concept of truth uh, because the reality is that it is the single most cost effective weapon to damage a free society. Here's the best example in recent memory. A lot of the anti-vax uh, propaganda that's being pushed around right now is actually connected to China and to Russia. Why? Because they understand that in the Western world, Germany, the UK, America, Canada, all these places, if they absolutely convince you that these vaccines are going to change your DNA and kill you and are super problematic, you're more likely than not going to not take it. The longer that uh, our economies go at a low vaccination rate, the longer they're going to stay shut down. So 
it's a super cheap weapon because you can cause billions, if not trillions of dollars of economic damage by having the pandemic last longer than it should have without ever firing a single bullet and maybe a few million dollars of investment in a PSYOPs campaign. Writing some bots, strategically posting things in certain forums, making some videos, having third-party services get the funding that they need to be able to continue spewing propaganda and so forth. Now, let's say you are an anti-vaxxer and you really firmly, 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 firmly believe in that concept. I'm going to ask you some tests. Did you actually look for alternative viewpoints? Did you come up with some mechanism and methodology to systematically analyze what you believe? You know, did you go ahead and go through a whole checklist of things? Are you a domain expert in vaccinology and biology? Do you have a lot of experience in that? Okay. Did you actually be honest with yourself, take the time to really dig deep, or did you watch a few videos on YouTube, read a few articles, these types of things? And yes, it's absolutely true that vaccines have killed people. And it's absolutely true that some vaccinations have resulted in all kinds of havoc in people's bodies. But are you intimately familiar with proportionality in the numbers about how many people have actually been injured and how much damage has actually been done relative to the benefits? Also, if you are citing data from the 1970s and 1950s and comparing it to today, are you making the statement that we haven't had 70 years or 50 years respectively of progress in medicine to be able to fix that problem? You know, I'm not telling you what to believe, but what I am saying is that there's a process that you have to go through before you should feel so certain in things that you're willing to make life and death decisions based upon it. And what you'll find when you leave the cave and you start taking the veil of propaganda off is that a lot of the things that you believe firmly are actually on very shaky foundations. And the reason why you believe these things is because we have cognitive biases. Human beings are very bad at dealing with uh, things like exponential growth. They're very bad at dealing with things that are far, far out there. We tend to have an availability bias. Um, and so that's not your fault. It's how a human brain is constructed. And it turns out the work you have to do to get out of that mindset is extremely difficult. And even professionals fail all the time. Many doctors, because of cognitive biases, got diagnoses wrong. Uh, many professors, because of their own biases, teach things that aren't true or are highly biased. Okay? Media takes advantage of this. Social media is no different. Nation states are no different. They understand these things and employ people with PhDs in psychology who study these things to purposely engineer information in a way that it propagates. It becomes memes. And it disarms and co-ops you to a point where you spread it just like Bob is going to spread that information to Jane and Bill and Jim. Okay. If we're actually going to survive social media, we have to understand that these networks can be both tremendously beneficial and incredibly harmful to society. What we witnessed January 6th with the Capitol was an example of a harmful event, but by no means is it the most harmful. In fact, far more bad events have occurred. And the only way we're going to get out of this is not by handing all of our power to fact checkers and to the platforms themselves, it's by a balanced multimodal approach, a multimodal approach where we have many things we have to come together. We have to share information in different ways. We have to share information in context of alternative sets of information. We have to create incentives for people to do things. We have to label things in different ways about what we've personally verified and we're willing to vouch and put our reputation, our money, or work for to share versus what we haven't vouched for. We have to create marketplaces for fact-checking where people can actually make money doing that, create a market system for it, and then pair them together so that you get many different viewpoints. We have to slow down our reactions to things that we see. And we have to always be asking, what is the evidence and remain professionally skeptical? 
And then when we construct communities, we have to accept that there's a difference between the terms of conduct for that community and the use of the system in general and the ability to associate with people. I do not believe ever that your freedom of association, commerce, or expression should be restricted just because you happen to have wonky ideas or be a deplorable person. I do believe, however, that people have the right to not be around disagreeable, toxic people. And if you're a disagreeable, toxic person, then you have to then be put into the box. Now, if you're in a collection of people, society has an obligation to break that collection up. If you're an individual, the isolation and exile alone ought to be enough to be able to moderate the behavior because human beings have a desire to belong. In certain cases, it's not, and then other things have to be done, but you should never look at a group and vilify an entire group. So, for example, in America, 74 million people voted for Trump. I have seen, I counted them today, 19 articles in my news feed equivocating those 74 million people to be white supremacist Nazi sympathizers. How do I live in a nation where almost half of my nation has just been called a, a sympathetic to one of the most evil movements of the 20th century? I'm willing to wager that the people who wrote those 19 articles don't know all 74 million of those people don't know what's in their hearts, don't know how they think, their motivations. Maybe there was one person in that group that just didn't want their taxes to go up. And that's the only thing they cared about. But apparently they're a Nazi. You cannot live in a society where you do these types of groups and divisions and expect that society to have good outcomes. If you truly wish to label people things before you do that, you need to engage them and give them a chance, talk to them, and if you have a properly functioning social media system, it should have built within it the capabilities to do that. And the good news is that our blockchain space actually has a lot of tools pre-built in. So for example, uh, throttling of information spread, you can do that with proof of work. We can create currencies and we do mechanism design, which is incentives engineering all the time. We build reputation systems all the time. DIDs enable real life identities or aliases with reputation metrics behind them to propagate. The pairing of idea flow and the construction of knowledge graphs, this can easily be done with blockchain technology. In fact, many entrepreneurs in our space are looking at these things and thinking about how to do and accommodate these things. But there's a more meta thing, regardless of what the tools are. It's the duty that falls upon each and every one of our shoulders. The people who disagree with us are not often evil. They just have a different viewpoint and they perhaps have different values. And understand that when people have different values, you're not going to agree on a lot of common grounds because they're looking at a problem from a very different viewpoint. And so you're both right and you're both wrong in that setting. So the only way you can ever get beyond that is to have empathy for their values, not necessarily acceptance or sympathy, but empathy in that you understand where they're coming from. And if you don't spend the time to understand where they're coming from, then you're never gonna accomplish anything. There's a large chunk of the people in that 74 million who voted for Trump who honestly believe that globalism is killing the United States. And they have ample evidence for that. There are ghost towns in the Midwest, a whole bunch of closed factories. We're getting systematically poorer and the wealthy superclasses, many of which happen to be Democrats, uh, they keep getting richer and richer and richer and richer. You know, for example, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and these others, uh, they say, oh, we should have higher taxes. And oh, yes, we do agree with all these liberal viewpoints, but then somehow, some way their wealth doubles when the rest of America is being hurt. These are not isolated events, and I'm not blaming or saying that they're caused by any one particular actor, but as a block, if this group witnesses this and they see that an elite class is getting more powerful and wealthy while they're getting poorer and feeling that they've been given the, the, the stick for globalism, 
they're probably as a political coalition going to be deeply angered by it. It's just the same with the context of the rise of Nazism. None of these things happen in isolation. You have to look at the context of society as it was back then. They just lost a world war. Uh, a lot of people in the country believed falsely that the war was still winnable and that they were betrayed by their government. Uh, there was an unstable economic situation. A lot of people who used to be rich were now poor. A lot of very angry veterans who felt that they had been shafted. And there was also a dangerous ideological movement where communism was seeping its way into Germany. And uh, they saw the Bolshevik revolution in Russia succeed. And so many people believed it would eventually be successful in the whole of Europe. And so people, when they were looking to an inept government and had a lot of anger, were willing to engage actors who were promising them a way out. Now, it doesn't condone or excuse their behavior, but you have to have empathy and context for what has occurred and understand that people aren't monoliths just like that gentleman does when he goes and engages members of the Ku Klux Klan. Many of the members of the American Ku Klux Klan, they didn't go and sign up at the airport. They were born into that environment. Their father and grandfather and great-grandfather were members of that organization. They were radicalized since birth. That's what they know and where they exist. It's just like most people with their religions. Most people who are Christian are Christian because their parents are Christian. Most people who are Muslim are Muslim or Jewish are Jewish because their parents were Jewish. They inherited these beliefs reinforced from the earliest days they can remember and through ritual and ritual and ritual. And what ends up happening is that as we grow older, we get more life experience, we start realizing that maybe we don't agree with all the orthodoxies our parents have inflicted upon us. And we start drifting a little bit. And that's what those weak links are all about. There will always be radicals and hardliners and fundamentalists, and they do exist, and it's damn near impossible to get rid of them completely. But at the very least, you can diminish that. So if people had empathy and they actually walked into what these 74 million were saying, they'd realize they agree with each other more than not. And the same for the 80 million who voted for Joe Biden in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of empathy one can have there too. In fact, many of the problems that the 74 million are complaining about are the exact same problems that the 80 million are complaining about. Both sides have an issue with fairness. Both sides are saying the system is rigged and they're seeking a resolution of that. The reason why they're not agreeing and having a kumbaya moment is that first there are synthetic divisions that are created amongst them because it creates power for people. Divisions are usually created for the purpose of power but also they have different values. A lot of people on the other side are looking at empowering government entities to have the ability to rebalance the scales, and they call this the justice movement. They say we have to take these entities that have been purposefully, in their view, depowered and re-empower and reinvigorate them put diversity within them, and then push for social justice and economic justice and racial justice and rah, rah, rah all the way through. And then on the other side, they say, well, if we increase freedom and uh, make the markets fair and get rid of the cronyism and corporatism, then what will end up happening is that that will enrich people. And once we've enriched people, people can find ways to carve out their own fairness. For example, the wealthier you are, the harder it is to oppress you because people are fearful of attacking people with wealth and power, so they're more likely to treat them with respect and fairness, or at the very least, not attempt to oppress them, because they can shoot back, they can punch back. It's just like a protest. If all the protesters are unarmed, you're much more likely to shoot rubber bullets and tear gas at them. If the protesters are all armed, you're much less likely to shoot rubber bullets and tear gas at them, because they might shoot back at you, right? So these are different values that exist. One is this belief of self-determination and the ability to build things yourself, grow yourself, and achieve wealth and prominence. The other is saying that the system will not allow you to do that, and therefore we need to empower some entity to balance things. Now, again, I'm not taking a position or a side, but empathy demands that we try and understand where people are coming from. 
And I, I haven't done an adequate job of really iron manning the arguments on both sides. I'm just using it in the interest of time as an example. If you have an effective information curation and sharing platform, what it can do is create a collective empathy amongst its members. And that collective empathy is the emergent property that you're looking for. We may not agree with each other. We may not share the same values, but we at least understand each other. And a collective empathy encourages engagement. And the more engagement you have, the less radicalization you have. And then you'll see an ever diminishing amount of violence. More friendships form and uh, more people happy about the outcome. We don't have that with social media and the deplatforming and uh, criminalization of thought is not going to accomplish that. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's actually going to pull people together and it's going to take chunks of these people and make them very, very, very angry to a point where they feel their only recourse is with violence because there's no other outlet. Can't vote their way out of it. They've been delegitimized and so forth. And that's the direction society is heading. I firmly believe our industry actually has a great toolbox because we can do the incentives engineering. We can marry AI to these systems. We can really reward good evidence. We can reward good productive sharing. And of the things I've mentioned here, for example, with how Alice shares information and how Bob curates, and these are just a small sampling. If we were to construct a social network, there's probably 50 or 100 tools in that tool bag that we'd have to pull out. And there's people at Stanford who study this. There's people at MIT who study this. There's a lot of papers that have been written. Cornell has some great people as well uh, that I think can be tremendously productive. Um, you can encode with terms of conduct. There's like a gnomic a game where the players evolve the rules. You can do that with a curated community. There's some cool, really things you can do there. You can incentivize engagement especially engagement with people who are radically different from you. And the end goal ought to be that we're creating collective empathy built on a basis of good idea flow. If we achieve that, then we get wisdom. We grow as people because it turns out that some of the values we hold are not so good. And it turns out that perhaps other values ought to be adopted and you start caring about people. Even if you oppose them and even if you're on the other side, you feel a respect for them and a desire to have them around. Uh, and so as a consequence, you want the best for everyone in the system. And that ent empathy will be, uh, will be reciprocal. The other people will start caring for you. And that's the highest art of a well-ordered and well-functioning society is the ability to forge collective empathy develop wisdom and care for each other, even if you don't have a strong reason to do so. Okay, so those are some of my preliminary thoughts. It's a very big topic. There's a lot to do here. I've undoubtedly pissed some people off uh, by how I've labeled some things or talked about vaccines or things like that. And if you feel a sudden visceral anger over anything that I've said here, you are probably the victim of propaganda and you're probably not responsible for that. It's been installed in you through an exterior source. I'm just talking about process, and I'm just using this as an example of how you can be manipulated. We all are manipulated, myself included, uh, by people for power, whether that be uh, nation state power or it be economic power, whatever it may be, people do this all the time. You know. The evil of Trump was that he built a relationship with a lot of people, 74 million people at the very least. And a lot of these people are great people who have been given a very bad hand. Imagine being born into a family where your father is a meth addict and um, your mother is on her fourth marriage and there's mental and sexual abuse there. Imagine if you have family members who have mental illnesses. Imagine if you went to war and you came back with severe disabilities. And every day you feel like no one cares about you. 
What Trump was able to do was that he found elements of society that he calculated were underappreciated or effectively on the fringes, and he unified them and created a coalition of them and said, I am your guy. I fight for you, and I'm going to give you a voice. And so when people attack Trump, for those people who were in the coalition, it was not an attack on Trump. Just like when people were attacking, unlike, for example, when people were attacking Bush uh, or Obama, there wasn't that same level of kinship where it's, oh, well, they attacked George Bush. Never once uh, did any Republican say, well, they're attacking me. No, they're attacking Bush. But with Trump, they took it personally because they said this is the first time ever in my life or one of the few times in my life that I've had real power at the highest level of power. Now, with that coalition, this man could have done a lot. He, and in some cases, he did do some great things, like he exposed the hypocrisy of the political class and the collusion between the right and the left in the United States, where they said a lot of stuff, but they didn't really mean a lot of the things that they said. And they worked together a lot more than they'd let on and the things that they work together on are some of the most destructive things in America, like the warfare culture of the United States, where we've been constantly at war somewhere in the world for decades and decades and decades, and they've effectively disarmed the peace movement and depowered them uh, for monetary reasons. So there was some great exposition of malfeasant behavior with that coalition being an outsider. But when you're a leader of a large group of people, especially people who have been disenfranchised and marginalized, you have a moral responsibility to lead them well and lead them with integrity and to fight for a higher truth and a higher principle. And what always happens with these people who gain so much power so quickly is that it becomes less about who they take care of and the principles upon which they were pushed into power and more about how do they preserve that power for themselves. If Trump actually honestly believed that there was election fraud, then the solution for that would have been using his gigantic bully pulpit, instead of trying to preserve the presidency, to go and fundamentally change the way that we elect people in the United States. And because he's loyal to a higher principle, uses considerable financial resources and that coalition to go and change every ballot in every place in the U.S. and expose the corruption and hypocrisy. This act alone would have set up his children to run for president in just eight years, 12 years time, and he would have had the strongest political coalition since Ronald Reagan to ride into that. Instead, he chose to spend what little time he had left in office complaining that an election was stolen from him damaging the own political party that he co-opted to gain power and disenfranchising all of his political allies and becoming persona non grata. This is not the act of a person who seeks higher truth and principles and movements. It's the act of a narcissist. I've called him the orange goblin many times, and I've been very critical of Trump many times. Now, in some cases, I do have conservative values or libertarian values, and so, unfortunately, people are so radicalized and propagandized that they feel that because I have those, that I must support people that I don't. I've never been a supporter of Trump. I find him a thoroughly distasteful human being. But I have empathy for the people who follow him, and I have no umbrage against the people who follow them. Some of the people in his coalition are the most abused and trivialized and hard off lifestyles across the United States. Uh, they're the oil rig workers. They're the ex-felons. They're people who have really had a hard time. And I understand how difficult it can be for them. And I have tremendous empathy for them. And I understand why they felt a guy like Trump was their guy. Because frankly, Mitt Romney's not. Jeb Bush is not. Hillary Clinton is not. People who go to Harvard people who are born into families with hundreds of millions of dollars, people who have come from political dynasties where there are generations of people who have held powerful office, will never understand the pain it is to go and be a roughneck on an oil rig or fight in a war as an enlisted soldier and come back with broken hearing and 
burns over your body and traumatic brain injuries uh, to find out as you come home from war that your wife is cheating on you and go through a brutal divorce and find out that the divorce uh, laws are, are not so much in favor of men. I'm so sorry. You're just not going to have that kind of common shared experience. And for whatever reason, Trump had this unique superpower to convince that group of people that somehow he understands that, despite the fact that he's none of those things and he comes from the same blue bloods as everybody else. And because he built that bond, there's that loyalty there. To call those people Nazis is a disgusting, despicable thing. They're Americans, and a lot of them were related to. Some of them were married to. Some of them our family members, some of them are us. And we're never going to get anywhere unless we develop a collective empathy. And for the first time in human history, social media actually gives us a superpower to do that if it's constructed correctly. So this is the great challenge of the 21st century. And if we fail this test, what we will be doing is weaponizing this technology to empower totalitarian governments and dictators to preserve power and divide us in ways that were unimaginable just 50 years ago. If we succeed this test, then suddenly as a society, we're going to evolve, develop a lot more wisdom and start caring about each other in ways that we never thought we would and learn things in ways that we never thought we could. And so society will get better. So it is the great test of our time. And I'm glad that my industry intersects with it. And I hope you found this video as useful as I found making it. If anything, perhaps it's a little therapeutic to know uh, where we're at and where we could go. And again, if I've offended you, uh, then really think deeply about why. And really think deeply about where your beliefs come from. And try to have some empathy about where I'm coming from. I don't have all the answers. I'm just one guy. And no matter how brilliant or lack thereof, uh, or how confident or justified my confidence may be. I'm just one person. And this is the way I view things. And I think it might work. But at the end of the day, this only can work if we can find a way to understand each other and view things with some common frame of reference. So if we at least accomplish that, maybe we will get it done. Thanks for listening.